We're good to go. Welcome to the July meeting of the Juvenile Justice Subcommittee of the Youth Development Division. Um, and um, want to just update the reason we're having our meeting today, kind of a short, uh, is that we had approved or recommended for approval to the YDC all but one of the counties, and we re recommended approval for all of the counties. Um, but we had asked to report back to this committee um, from staff on the conversation with Douglas County um, and just to make sure that uh, we had confidence that there was just more information that was just not written down, but that the that it was going to meet the needs. And so uh, Lawrence and Anya, I think were able to reach out or to connect up with Douglas County. Is that accurate? I would ask Lawrence to give you an update because I understand Lawrence and Adrian have been working with Douglas County to get the information that was missing. Hello, everyone. So yes, um, I reached out to uh, Douglas County. Uh, they did send a um, an additional addendum with some information on it. Um, it, it supplied some more information that's concerning um, the JCP plan they had originally um, submitted. Um, it added to that, um, but Adrian, um, the council member, wanted more information from the particular third party uh, um, options consulting um, service provider that they would be using um, explicitly um, stated in the plan. So um, since then, um, I've reached out to them. Um, again, I'm still um, trying to make real contact with them to continue to work with them to get those answers uh, for um, our council member. So Lawrence, just to, just to be clear, so there is still ongoing communication. Specific. Um, questions um, that Adrian had um, that I'm trying to elicit from uh, Douglas County in lieu of reaching out to the third party um, service provider. Sure. So confident that we're moving forward, Lawrence? Yes, I am. Um, um, like I had uh, mentioned, um, Douglas County did um, provide an additional addendum um, originally. There's just some follow-up questions concerning that um, as well as um, some follow-up questions from the original um, request that we had. So we're we're confident that they're going to uh, provide us with that information and we can move forward. Super appreciate that. Super appreciate Adrian also working with you and doing that just as our subcommittee representative with that. So um, we'll keep it maybe on the, the list as just a quick update for future meetings till we just kind of have that done. Um, Anya, how about reports back from all agreements are out the door, I believe. Is that correct? So this is slight challenge that occurred. The procurement started working on the amendments in a time frame that was challenging for most counties and tribes to get the agreements extension signed and returned in time before Ju the end of business day on June 30th. So what left us, we have 22, no, I'm sorry, 23 counties and tribes. I think there are like four tribes included in that uh, number. So it leaves what, 19 counties that did get the extension signed through an amendment, which, so was those, ones we will continue with another amendment and i'm just like literally been with procurement all morning online so if you had an amendment and you got it signed oh. and executed in time before the previous biennium ended then you should be receiving a new amendment with the amount of money for the 2325 biennium and um, um, we will be sending that email communication to people so they understand what's what's to expect. Now, those who didn't make it in time, and again, this is on our end, 
the request was not sent out was a adequate amount of time. And also there was some misunderstanding from people didn't quite understand that to get an agreement signed by a county government or a tribal council, it takes a little longer than a couple of days. So, so with that, however, it was not possible to reinstate agreements and that's what I've been dealing with procurement for the last few days. So, so the new rule will, <laughs> the different rule will, or rather different process will be applied to those who didn't get them signed. So we will be entering into new intergovernmental agreements with them. And the promise from procurement is that because we will be signing with other governmental entities, so it will be yet another IGA, it's still going to be a grant, but it is an IGA. So that shouldn't take longer. So my next step with procurement is I'm asking them to get those uh, agreement started, the language will be the same. There'll be no change from the last uh, biennium, but hopefully this process will go fast enough, given that not a whole lot of changes taking place. And I'm thinking that probably the amounts of money will be known at about the same time. So there won't be any difference for the amendment or for a new agreement, but that's where we're at. Okay, so yeah, yeah. And most counties schedule out their here their uh, um, their meetings every two weeks. So you're right; it's a challenging piece. Yes, um, I appreciate the ongoing um, uh, conversation and communication with counties, and and really the liaisoning with procurement. <laughs> yeah. So, so Anya, can I just make uh, oh, ask I a clarifying question? Of course. So we were closed last week, so there was no business being done the first week. Not not we, my department, the commissioners were closed, county administration basically. So um, we did not make that June 30th thing. So did I hear you correctly? Now we should just sit tight and wait for the new IGA to come out since we didn't do the amendment instead yeah. of, because right before I got on here, Ed asked me, my um, person who handles our money stuff, he said, do we still need to do that amendment? And then no, have no, an IGA? The, no, no, okay. no, unfortunately. Um, and I don't want to pretend that I know procurement rules enough to have a professional opinion about it. But the rules that have been explained and conve conveyed to me is, that if the agreement was not extended and fully, oh, I shouldn't say agreement, an ex uh, amendment was not fully executed by the day mm -hmm. when the agreement ended, it's no longer in existence. And it may not be reinstated, or rather it might be reinstated, but the process to reinstate an agreement and then extend it an amendment for money will take longer than entering into a new agreement with a governmental entity. Right. So that's that's the promise. So we're working on both sides right now. Okay. Great. So hopefully, time-wise, it's not going to take longer. But I, I cannot honestly promise. Well, I'm saying that we're we're doing all, all we can. But it 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 has been uh, as always anything that has to go through procurement and other areas outside of our control has been a challenge, but we will overcome. Anya? Yes. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and then don't look at who, who I'm emailing. I'm just sharing to you uh, because, well, actually I can't share. Um, I have an email thread. Um, my suggestion would be whatever procurement tells you, also look it up in the OERs. And the reason why is that just like at the end of June, procurement told me um, they needed to get DOJ um, legal sufficiency review. And, and I said no. And then I quoted the OERs and then the, and the procurement unit um, backtracked because the agreement was only for, for 10,000, not 
um, even though th the total amount was over 150,000, the way the OERs read is that if the amendment was for over 150, not the total agreement. So um, my advice to you would be to look at the um, procurement rules and um, procedures because we have a lot of new procurement people and they may, they may not know what they're doing. I'm just, and then I have emails right here, like, you know, to show, like it's an example of where I, I had to quote, you know, oh, I can share now. Like, you know, like they said, like exceeding over 150. Um, can you see the screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like over 50. Then then when I, you know, I quoted the, um, our agreement amount and I quoted the OAR. What is know. the number? And then the person Three. said, you know, after they reviewed it, he agreed. You know, so so my thingy would be like, um, yeah, oh, it's like. I'm just um, looking at the number. Yeah, one three five dash zero four five dash zero zero five zero. I would look at you know review the um, procurement OERs and statutes too, um, especially if if you feel something is not right. Um, I always look it up. Well, I appreciate you sharing with that because I did contest and I did speak with Philip, who's the deputy procurement director, whatever that title is, and. He reminded me that he's just following the law, but I will look this up because last biennium, we went through quite a challenge was, well, basically we were challenging procurement rules because they would not let us use grant process with government entities. And our point was it's still an interagency agreement, just we're using it in a grant format because it's easier for us and for people who receive the funds to process the money. Because with contracts, it's just like the paperwork is insane. Anyway, so I appreciate you doing that, but uh, I, I will check that. But um, So Anya, on the different amounts that are coming out on the new agreements, minimums are staying the same. See that part I don't know yet because see we we have we have that thing that's why I'm just like not super concerned about not getting the amendment executed in time because we we still have time until we know how much money to add. Okay. So, Port uh, and I will be looking at the old grid for the previous biennium, but also I just sent an email to Debbie Martin, OIA, asking for the population numbers that they used for basic and diversion. So we, we have the same baseline. So when, <laughs> yeah. And was that given how much money we know was allocated for uh, JCP total? Um, I had it somewhere. It's, it's not a huge increase. It's about like 200,000 extra dollars. Right. Maybe a little more, but it will likely change an option for or minimum grant. I just we just don't know how much, and we don't know yet until we see the population numbers if there are any proportionate sort of changes for counties where we count. The, on the cusp, those on the, cusp, those, the yeah. cusp, yeah. So so we're still kind of we're, we're not ready with that, but meanwhile, um, I will work well i will look at the uh, rules again and see if there is still some so some kind of communication option or negotiation option if you will but technically what it will the difference will be if if it's a new agreement you'll have a new number if it's an old agreement you'll still have the same number that makes sense but um but there will be no changes in the language okay. so or conditions or anything you know uh perfect actually um and yeah perfect that works good and um will we see are you anticipating or hoping to have those out the door before our next meeting well if we have a meeting in august then yes Hey, um, so hopefully, just 
just so we can see the grid so we are kind of just have a, an awareness of it of course so maybe we should have a, another meeting in, in august maybe also a short one another hour meeting mm -hmm. um, especially uh as we talk about the cjj and the annie casey probation reform update mm -hmm. and how we're going to move forward with that um that also may just be so yes let's hold a little tickler for that okay sounds good but yes yeah, so, so sorry just like an ongoing process at this point so out of curiosity so many other procurements are going to oregon buys is ode going to go to, towards oregon buys have you guys heard that at all we are i think it's already gone mm -hmm. okay but then um but then molly for oh, oh. can i jump in real quick sam yeah we could go through Oregon Rise, but we choose to post our, you know, our RFA process through this the SM Apply and our own sort of portal. So okay. we don't have to. I do not think we are going to. But Sam, feel free to jump in. Right, and, and similar to Brian, Molly, for our JADA, YSEP, LTCT, and other programs, um, we got a couple by any go. We don't even have to put it out for RFP. Right. Um, we can go directly to, you know, so, um, but then if there's people that want to, you know, we don't even have to advertise. Like, remember a couple of years ago for Norquare, we did, but then procurement said we don't have to do it anymore. But if, but if people want to, then we would have to go through the former realm. Okay. So just from a county perspective, um, learning the ins and outs with Oregon buys and um, there's unique you're, there's uniqueness with that. I don't know if Christina or Tori want to weigh in. Um, uh, our road department tends to use Oregon buys way more than we use Oregon buys, and it's created some interesting glitches for us. So anyway, we're working through it. We'll get it there, but um, it has been an interesting ride. Okay. Last thoughts about that. We're gonna go into our next conversation, which is super exciting. Um, and I am gonna ask um, Lawrence and Anya to weigh in here in just a second. Um, we were able to Quick history, we applied for and were accepted for the NEKC and the juvenile um, CJJ uh, performance, probation reform, technical assistance. And so we had a team go back to Baltimore in, um, I think it was June, <laughs> we all went back and spent a day really at the NEKC Foundation kind of doing some planning and some collaborative learning. Um, from other sites, and there were several states there that were doing some similar work. And so I'm going to ask just to kind of give an overview of their experience. So um, what it was like, we had a team of five from our um, state participate. Debbie Martin from the Oregon Youth Authority joined us. Marcella, Ortega, our chair of our youth committee, as well as a member of our juvenile justice committee. Anya, um, Lawrence, and myself. So Anya and Lawrence, would you like to just share about our, our experience? Well, sure. Um, so we were one of the five states who were invited to participate in that, in that really full day training. Started out early and it went all day. And it was a lot of it was sort of experience and challenges exchange between the states. Uh, it was mentioned that in the state of Washington, it's Pierce County that's been leading this work. And of course, Tracy, welcome to Clackamas County and to us. <laughs> and of course, Multnomah County experience was uh, also noted but i think what what is basically what they're asking us to do is to consider investing state advisory group 
dollars, meaning Title II formula grant, into supporting probation reform in states, which we could do coming the next three year cycle was fiscal year 24. That's 24, 25, 26. But before we make such a commitment and put it into our next three year plan, we need to do some groundwork. So basically, maybe, and I'm probably jumping, Molly asked me to share about my experience <laughs> at the training, but I'm like, and what are we going to do next? What are our next steps? So at some point, hopefully sooner, and I know it's challenging to do things during the summer, but maybe we need to reconvene the group of five, but also um, ask Tracy to join us. Is that right, Christina? That was your hope? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and figure out what it is and how we will proceed from here on. And I did get some confirmation from Coalition for Juvenile Justice because I felt, I don't know if, if other people felt it, but I felt a little bit left hanging by them. <laughs> After we left, it wasn't quite clear if there will be any type of technical assistance and support offered as we you know, continue on this journey. But I did get a confirmation from them that yes, they will be providing technical assistance and helping along the way. They just haven't figured out themselves yet what it will look like. So that's my two okay. cents. Great. Lawrence, how about you, your takeaways? Uh, my takeaway um, was the, uh, the experience and also um, some of the challenges that the other states faced as well. But also, it was just um, an overall um, gathering of collective ideas on how we can improve our system based on some of the challenges that others may have faced and or some of the similar problems that we all face. So I, I thought it was um, a great convening um, um, of five different states with um, differences in how they you know, Okay. Yeah. Brian, you, or Lawrence, you cut out a little bit. Did I cut you off? Articulate the juvenile probation programs and how we could learn from them and as well as how they learn from us also because of uh, the, the uniqueness of our state and uh, the metropolitan area, the rural area. Oh, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, so. I, I think I, one of the takeaways I, um, so I always like to start with strengths, right? So one of the takeaways was, um, it was pretty quick to say they all want JGIS. <laughs> the other five states that were there. Um, and um, that was fun to, to be the owner or to be partners with having Debbie Martin right there with us and her expertise on JGIS of being a little bit um, a little bit thankful that we have the data system that we have. But it was also interesting in um, as amazing as our data system is, um, some limitations we found in the questions that they were asking us around successful completing com completion of probation and how we measure um, success to the uh, actual um, conditions of probation. And that was some interesting kind of conversation around how do you measure to the to the to the actual condition. Um, what we also discovered, which most everyone around this table knows, is that we're a complex system. Um, and that we're a centralized, decentralized system in the state of Oregon. Um, and that um, 85 to 90% of our youth never touch the court system. It's a diversion and really understanding how diversion fits in the state of Oregon um, because many states have are different, right? Police departments can do diversion. Um, and I think Deschutes County used to have kind of a robust, Bend PD had a robust kind of police diversion program. Um, but there, I think that what was really good in, in a Casey Foundation kind of style is you use data 
and you look at your information that you have. And then it was also really a youth driven day. Um, a team of uh, three youth were really the drivers of, of a lot of our discussion at the table. And what it really highlighted to us is ensuring we figure out how to bring youth voice to our system. And one of them is not very far away from us. She's in, in Idaho. Um, and so she is the current chair of CJJ's National Youth um, Leadership Group, um, SAM. And really around their stories all brought a moment of time of where the system didn't listen to them and where the system, if they had listened to them and they had found their voice could have assisted in helping them be accountable. And so um, one of the takeaways I think that, that I am hopeful for is as a, our committee thinks through um, using some Title II funds is what that structure might look in Oregon. And so creating a steering committee potentially out of this group that takes on that kind of policy level probation reform. It also seems incredibly timely because CJ, CSG, Council of State Governments was mentioned at this um, convening that we had. And in fact, as we were sitting at the table, um, um, we had the opportunity to spend some time with Steve Bishop who is the head of this um, juvenile justice policy group at the Annie Casey Foundation. And he shared that he had been to Oregon and had spent time with Multnomah County. Um, and then he went to a training of our judges. And we didn't know about that. And that was a little bit like, um, wow, we need to connect some dots and maybe using the probation reform, maybe a way to connect some of the dots with the criminal or criminal council of state government's work with our SAG um, and having that SAG, the, having us as a SAG be able to um, be a voice and a liaison with the OJDDA as well as um, uh, great AEK, I don't know who you are, but that's amazing. <laughs> um, uh, to have that, <laughs> to have that linkage, um, the <laughs> having that linkage as um, having Steve come out, which several of us have worked with Steve in the past over the years. I know that Tracy knows Steve. I know that Christina knows Steve. I've known Steve for a long time. Um, and just not, not knowing that we are having um, a national partner speak to our judges was, was um, what finding out that we had a national partner speaking to our judges was pretty amazing. So anyway, I am welcome, um, judge. If you wanna weigh in, you're more than welcome to. I just want to, first of all, apologize to y'all for joining and not realizing I wasn't on mute. That was me slurping my smoothie. <laughs> on your zoom meeting so that awful sound was me apologize um i got i have friends in the education world and somebody sent me the link to this meeting and i saw that the agenda included that um annie e. casey funding and i thought wouldn't it be crazy if we didn't know that we were all doing the same work and here we are um finding that out and i i think the common link here was the trainer who was steve i think that you're talking about um and I think the lesson, I'm in Klamath County, my name's Alicia Kersey, and the lesson that I've been learning in our county is that we all get into these silos and um, like, where does juvenile probation need to start transforming, right? Where does it need to start? It needs to start at, you know, in the building with the probation or the juvenile counselor, but it also has to start in a courthouse, it has to start in schools, it has to start everywhere. So we should be having these conversations across um silos more often and um i'm just grateful that somebody sent me the link to this meeting so i could hear your thoughts on it so that's all i have to say welcome welcome um and um you're always invited back and in fact um one of our 
pieces for our um, SAG, which is the state advisory, is to have judicial representation on it. And um, the Honorable um, Pamela Abernathy was with us for years. Um, and then she decided like she really did want to retire. <laughs> So anyway, you're more than welcome. Um, I'll let you and Anya connect up at some point. Great. Right. Thank you so much for um, letting me slurp in on your meeting. <laughs> Thanks. Any so time. <laughs> what do others think about doing um, kind of a steering committee um, to really walk through the toolkit and maybe create three or four pilot sites across the state? Understanding that Multnomah County is a pilot site for the Annie Casey Foundation. Um, but that um, this is a partnership that would allow others to join in and learn from some of the technology transfer information. I think that's a great idea, Molly, and I think um, it, it would be great to be able to give that technical assistance to some of the other counties that aren't currently involved with any KC. Um, so yeah. I'm I'm all for it. That's why I, I asked if I could bring Tracy to the meeting here today um, because she does have so much expertise after having gone through the, you know, the initial certificate program at Georgetown when they tried to get this going a few years ago. Um, so yes. And by the way, nice to meet you, Judge. Uh, my name's Christina McMahon. I'm the Clackamas County Juvenile Department Director. Good to have you here. And I Thank didn't you. even notice your Slurpee because I was slurping away on my water. So Thank you. Anyway, it made me good. feel better. It made me feel better. Uh, we're not one of the, um, obviously, the sites for the Casey um, technical assistance. And I would love to have some help down here in our department. And we've, we're going to start rolling something out here pretty soon. And um, I, you know, the judges up at Multnomah um, and Mary and Amy Holmes Hine and um, some of the Mar Multnomah County judges are really fantastic and probably better talk like point people in OJD than I am. I'm just lucky to be here today, but I'm happy to join. So I think the beautiful part is it all starts somewhere, right? Um, those amazing judges all uh, threw their name in at one moment in time just to start down the journey. Okay, Brian, you came off. Um, you came on screen. Did you have something? <laughs> no, I'm just fiddling with my computer. <laughs> okay, that's totally okay. <laughs> um, okay, so let's think about a, st a, a steering committee. I think we need to make sure that we open it up to all of the juvenile justice subcommittee members because this is really as a perspective of from the SAG perspective. We're not going to be telling departments how to do anything, we're going to be able to set parameters for them to engage and provide the training and technical assistance for all of uh, all of the work that comes along. Um, and so I think we want to open it all to up to all of the juvenile justice subcommittee members, but I would love to have a few more people at the table as well to be advising and um, that have the, the technology. And so I'm really appreciative that Tracy is um, in a role now with Clackamas County that she has some, we, that Christina hasn't completely bogged down her calendar yet um, <laughs> to, to help us lead. And I actually fun. really looking at Tracy to be a leader in this particular piece because of your three different initiatives that you've helped lead with the Casey Foundation and CJJ. So JDAI, Deep End, as well as uh, Probation Reformation. Am I, it, it, yeah, well, and so Klamath is unique in all sorts of ways um, and is really set up, you guys have kind of a cool thing down in, in Klamath County um, with your structure, so, while you may not be a site, there's lots of things that we look towards Klamath. So I'm the director in Wasco County and um, Klamath is a partner with Kojak. I don't know if you've heard about Kojak yet. So yeah. So Tracy, are you up for that? Of course. <laughs> um, and so having subcommittee meetings just to really talk about the material, I do think it would be amazing if we could invite the youth members 
via Zoom or even in person to come talk about probation reformation. They're very powerful speakers. They really talk about what their experience was and where maybe they could have gone off this out of the system. Um, I will tell you that they all had stories that involved child welfare. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really powerful to me to hear um, as we have been talking about the age piece and different things is their stories all involved a story of child welfare and, and heavy incarceration. And none from the state of Oregon. Um, the other part was the family engagement key piece was really heavy. And so the other partner that we have that's not far away is Pierce County, Washington and their family engagement work. And so um, we got an invitation to come up and hang out with them anytime we wanted to. So back to my thoughts and planning. So juvenile justice subcommittee inviting Tracy to help us lead this. Others, how, who else do we think we need to make sure we have at the table? The judges. And I'm really hopeful that maybe we've convinced one that to at least join and listen and um, become an active participant. And especially with the OJD um, process that's moving forward, who others do we, what other groups do we need to invite to the table? Christina. Is it possible? To... Oh, Lawrence, were you going to say something? Oh, oh no, I'm can not. You guys, can you guys hear me? Kind of. Um, Lauren, sometimes if you turn off your camera, we could hear you better. There you go. Child welfare services, is it? Yeah, child welfare, Department of Human, that was definitely one we talked about around the table, seeing if we couldn't invite somebody from DHS to the table. Yep, good catch. Christina? Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, I agree with what the judge was saying before she had to leave about, you know, how the different aspects of transformation, but um, my, and I have not poured through all the materials like, uh, you folks that went to Baltimore and Tracy, you've lived it for now several years. But I also think the transformation includes um, changing a mindset about who needs to be on probation and getting upstream. So there's a whole bunch of kids around the state, and I'm 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 speaking for my own department because I've noticed this. You know, we've been working on making our own changes, but a whole bunch of of um, kids who get put on probation because of the nature of the charge that came in from law enforcement, not because they're high risk to um, continue to reoffend. It's because it's sort of that um, mindset that accountability um, is defined by certain actions. So going to detention is viewed by a lot of people as you're being held accountable. Being placed on probation um, is viewed by some people as that means you're really being accountable. Whereas there's other ways with those lower risk young people or those first time offenders, uh, I hate to even use that word, those first timers to our system that we could work with these young people uh, without having to put them on probation. And in fact, there's research that shows that when we drag them in deeper than they need to be, we actually do harm. So that is a real culture change, mindset change. Uh, you know, it used to be when I got to Clackamas, every kid who committed a felony just had a, had a petition filed. And thank gosh, we got a great uh, prosecutor who transferred out to the juvenile team. And he would go to my assistant director at the time, Mark, and he would say, hey, I know this, I know this kid got a, a burg too for, you know, a burglary, but um, this seems, this kid has no record. They've never been in trouble before. Couldn't we try an FA with this young person? And even at times saying, couldn't we send them to the diversion program? So when we 
when that person became a prosecutor with a different mindset, we were able to expand who didn't have to go to probation automatically. So I think that's a big area. So I don't think it's just, it, it's obviously it's about probation, but it's also keeping kids out of that gate from going through the gate. So absolutely. And what it really talked about was how to build that, not just in metropolitan areas, but how yes. do you build that in medium and small areas where there are not necessarily um, CBOs that do restorative justice that you can send them right. for youth to circles and you can refer youth to services. Yep. Um, and so the how do you do that scale? So I think actually there's a couple yep. different learnings. One is how do you do it urban? Yeah. Um, and then how do you do it small? Um, and then the other is at, at the gate points where things happen off, right? Uh, and again, thinking about our system, 85 to 90% of the kids are diverted off and don't go into court. In other states, that's not how diversion is defined, like how we define diversion. Again, they can define diversion that law enforcement sends them to the Boys and Girls Club or to the restorative justice and the referral never hits the juvenile justice system. And the other thing was, is how do we measure our conditions? And, you know, do, a young person that we order to go to school every day and pass all classes, yeah. how are we documenting or do we know that that's, like, what are the levels of success? And I know as OJDDA, we've kicked that around several times in the concept of JGIS on how do you measure um, case plans and service plans. And you also brought up, Christina, another key thing that we're so far ahead in Oregon than some of the rest of the country is our JC JCP risk prevention tool. Like we have some tools that we know who are low, medium, and high risk, but do we use low, medium, and high risk in our case management and decision-making tools, or do we just use the JCP to access money and, and how to bridge mm -hmm. those gaps? And the final thing was, that's great that you're using all of those things, but what incentives are you putting in place along the way with the JCP? It was that you're spot on in that, those, what you were just bringing up. So, so other players at the table that we need to make sure are on our steering committee. Well, I was, um, I went off as usual on my own tangent, but um, my point was, I think it would be helpful to have um, representation from folks that are on that upstream, more front end diverting, whether that is, um, last I knew, I know Jackson County has their own internal diversion program, but it's it's staffed by Jackson County Juvenile Department staff, right? I don't, I don't know if that's still the same way, but in my county, we divert kids by sending them to a community-based nonprofit. But, you know, there's different constellations of that. So um, that's, that's all I was going to suggest. People from yeah, the diversion think, community. And I think Marcella would echo that um, from her youth perspective and the Latino network is having, making sure that we are including up, upstream, a couple of providers upstream. Um, I would say someone from law enforcement representation. So, so I agree. And this is going to be my plea out to everyone. We're still missing law enforcement representation on a statewide basis. I think I have someone. I keep telling him and he was supposed to, he'll be at our August juvenile justice committee meeting. He could not make it today. He was at a, at a, an event. Um, but uh, I, I think I have somebody that's going to apply for YDC, by the way, Brian, to help us meet the um, law enforcement, kind of that statewide big picture. Yeah. Um, I'd love to talk to the person. Yes, I. Um, uh, yes, I think that would be amazing. You'll love it. He's great. He's he's great. So I want to make sure, so I, again, I want to make sure that we're, I love the recommendations. I want to make sure we're understanding we're, we're developing the framework for the SAG. Um, and, and so we need people who are able to speak for people. 
Right. Right. So we need people who are able, like when we, when we design and require individual groups to come together, then I think we need to make sure we have on their team, all of these different players represented. Um, Tracy, you want to like JDA, I'm most familiar with JDAI and the deep, deep end work. And in order to do that, they recommend like 10 different people be on your collaborative, your leadership collaborative, right? Right. Yeah, it's usually like the, the judge, DA, um, def, a defense attorney, uh, community. Uh, we even include us. Uh, we this time around for transfer information Multnomah, we had a staff member. We thought it was important because you kind of need your staff to buy into yeah, the transforming probation, and then uh, somebody that represented families. And we would have liked to have a youth, but at that time it didn't work out. So, yeah, and we're so lucky to have Maricela, right? As yeah, our, so you're as, good. You're good there. Well, that and she's just she is um, our the chair of our youth committee. So that she is not only a youth, but she's the chair of our youth committee. And Rolfi, you were a youth member, weren't you? Yeah. No, I don't, I'm, I probably just missed. Okay. I don't remember, is it 26? 30. 30, oh, I'm 30. It's 28. Oh, 28. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Split the difference. I was probably 30 when I joined. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and family, I think that's the other one that clearly um, was, and I don't know how to do that for a statewide kind of thought process. It might be the OFSN, the Oregon Family Support Network. So I'm thinking that maybe once we have a, once we get started with a steering committee, we can figure out what's the partnership on the local level need to be so I don't know if the statewide steering committee need to have representatives from all those different groups because will be a challenge you know it yeah, just it's creates create creates a challenge and it will probably a statewide view will not necessarily reflect in the local community and um, maybe I don't know Christine Molly there's a OGDA board meeting coming up yeah. in the week so maybe we could bring it up there and see if there are any volunteers. I mean, there's an obvious one, Tori, right here, but I don't want to, he's been quiet. So he doesn't look like he's like super volunteering himself. So I'm not going to put him on the spot, but. <laughs> uh, I don't think I can do that. I think it, there's a process <clears throat> for us around um, representation and I'm not really an official member of this committee. So um that also has to be taken into consideration. Sure. While you were here, I had to ask just to make sure you feel included. <laughs> so I think that what will what what I'm going to hear is what two things. One is I'd love to have a kickoff for this when we get going in a couple month month and a half, hopefully, um, and have some people zoom into the conversation um, and see if we cannot do that. I think we can have. Um, it is just a, it's a subcommittee of this group. So all of the information is just going to be filtering up into this group to then filter up to the YDC, which the YDC is actually the SAG. And so it kind of has this filtering process. And so we'll just be making recommendations up. So um, I think that, I think what the main purpose of the group will become um, is setting some kind of parameters around the title money, but also then creating um, uh, a dialogue and infrastructure to have conversations to learn from each other. Truly a learning lab is what we learned about at the um, back in Baltimore. And so um, it's not so much an authoritarian kind of you can do this. It's more of a collaboration for opportunities. So hopefully all 36 counties will get the opportunity to learn and be part of something if they choose to. It will not be exclusive. It will be over-inclusive. Yeah. How so, long is the technical assistance for Molly? Is it a year, you said? So um, it's for the 24 
it's in preparation for our next three-year grant cycle and we can write the technical assistance into our grant so that's what we'll be doing really the the framework for is how to spend and remember we don't get very much money from um the ojddp but it really our piece is around um the prioritizing the money we get from ojddp that doesn't mean that other things couldn't go towards that if a county so chose to do that and it also doesn't mean that there won't be additional dollars um, coming from CJ, CJJ, but the technical assistance is more um, in written form and in, in kind of one-off technical assistance. It won't be continued gatherings. Okay. So for 24, is that the federal, uh, so starting in, September or October one? It's so Anya, will you kick off? Is it when is the next? Is it October one of twenty twenty four or October one of twenty twenty five? Yeah, it's so confusing. Well, it will, and, I, and I'm thinking out loud because next item on the agenda is that we just received the solicitation for fiscal year twenty three, which is the last oh. year of the current three year cycle. So we really don't. Technically, the next three year plan and you know the money should start in 25. Yeah, October 25, right? October 1, 2025. So, in order for us to apply for that, we have to come up with a three year plan. When solicitation will be released for that funding, that I don't know because that date right. seems to move quite a bit. But if we are to include probation reform in our three-year plan, we need to start, well, we're already thinking about it, but we also need to start planning on it because it will require a bit of work. Yeah. yeah. So we have to have some state, well, some level of preparedness in the state that we can say that this is what we've, consulted with our stakeholders and this is what we want to do so so the, it, it's a process so it's never too late to start but my hope is that you give us a little bit of a cut us a little bit of a slack in july and august because we do need to apply for the federal fund <laughs> that's on our yeah. agenda we also need to apply for the prior grant that we got an extension so we can uh, do it so YA will be able to hopefully receive the funding that they could use to get closer to PREA standards. And we're still dealing with the JCP um, agreements. Yeah, so this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. I guess. Right, so if, if we could wait until hopefully maybe September to get this started, but does not preclude us from having conversations about it just identifying who needs to be invited to the table. Does it make sense? Yep. Okay. Okay. So, um, so with that, actually, we meet as a membership in September. Mm -hmm. Um, and so maybe that would be a better timeline and to give that to Anya in October to kind of kick off. And there'll be several, thanks, Sam, um, several um, additional times. So the Racial and Ethnic Disparity Conference in Kentucky is um, October 31st and November 1st. And I know that they'll be talking about that at as well there. Um, and um, so we, we have time. I think that's the best part. So maybe we'll come up with a strategy and have you guys approve it. So we actually have something to respond to in writing. Mm -hmm. And then, and again, Christina, I'm going to, if you're okay with it, is really asking Tracy to help do some of the lead on this because you have led so many of these initiatives before. So. Oh yes, she would not be here if I wasn't okay with it. I know. Unlike Tori, I'm happy to volunteer someone else. 
<laughs> you already have. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting piece, and this committee is um, just such a wonderful representative of it. Is um, juvenile departments are a critical piece at, at a player at the table, but we're not the only player at the table, and it's a fascinating piece um, to to really learn and see who all of the different states brought um, to the meeting was was. It was really interesting. It was right. Fun. But also, more another thing, the advisory committee to the judicial department is meeting on Thursday this week. So we can and we will bring up this opportunity for collaboration to them as well. Okay. You know, the juvenile, juvenile delinquency court reform. Yeah. Uh, that's who the Stephen was talking to. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Last thing on the agenda, I we have a tight get off. I have a tight end because we have I have another meeting, and I think I'm going to see two other people shaking their head. Um, that they have that same hard end that I have. Is that right? Um, is there anything else on the agenda, Anya, that we need to have any decisions on today? No, there are no decisions. Um, I kind of gave you an update that we're working on those two solicitations okay. now. So thumbs up or thumbs down, an hour meeting in August. Okay, so please um, mark your calendar for August 7th at 2 p.m. All right, anything else for the good of the order? Anya, please reach out to that judge. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Get them while they're hot. Yeah, I know, while she's interested. <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah. All right, thanks guys. Topics for email. <laughs> yes, okay. Thank you, bye. Bye. bye.